few steps away from one of its symbolic squares, Piazza Navona, is the National Church of France, San Luigi de Francesi. The church was built in the 16th century to accommodate the large French community present in the city. Construction began under the pontificate of Pope Clement VIII at the end of the 16th century and bears the signature of the same architects of St. Peter's Basilica, Domenico Fontana and Giacomo della Porta. The church houses three masterpieces by Michelangelo Merisi, better known by his nickname, Caravaggio. Milan has a tremendous legacy. Leonardo da Vinci lived there for almost 20 years. But in Milan, Caravaggio had really learned how to oil paint. So where in Florence and in Rome, we're using these big frescoes that cover huge walls, Caravaggio had learned to work on canvas to paint very, very precise, beautiful paintings. So he comes to Rome and he's trying to break into this scene, but generally they prefer the painters who have more experience, they prefer the painters who know how to fresco, they prefer the painters who have a, a, a portfolio of drawings, and it seems like Caravaggio is never going to get a break. And then in 1599, when another more famous painter couldn't be bothered, Caravaggio was tapped for the job in San Luigi de Francesi, the National Church of the French. And for the very first time, he was going to be making large-scale paintings in a chapel for the jubilee year of 1600, where you could expect millions of viewers to come and see it. What a thrilling moment it must have been. These three images painted by Caravaggio are placed in the Contarelli Chapel at the far left side of the church. They tell the story of the evangelist Matthew, his vocation, the divine inspiration he received in writing Holy Scripture, and finally, his martyrdom. The Church of San Luigi dei Francesi had a very special mission for 1600 because the King of France, Henry IV of Navarre, had just converted to Catholicism. He was a Huguenot. He had just become a Catholic. And so the church, the, the, the papacy, wanted that church to speak to all the pilgrims talking about conversion. You can never too late to change your life. And so one of the cardinals, his name was Matthew Contarelli, commissioned this chapel with the stories of his namesake, St. Matthew. And it's a wonderful story of not just calling, it means a great deal, that painting to priests, because it's a story of a vocation, but it's also a story that speaks to everyone because it is the story of conversion. We have the story of Matthew, a tax collector, a wealthy man with everything he could possibly want. Then we see Matthew leaving, the, the, the world of the tax collector. We see him again in the altarpiece painted by Caravaggio writing the gospel. And then we see Matthew's ultimate end at the, at the, on, the, on the right hand side, the martyrdom of Saint Matthew. So these three seminal moments in the story of this, this great saint painted by Caravaggio as he sort of breaks out of the starting gate with a whole new way of telling this ancient, ancient story. Caravaggio was just 20 years old when the Catholic world was shaken by the Protestant Reformation. At this stage in the history of the church, the popes themselves used art as an instrument to crush the Lutheran heresy. When the Protestant Reformation begins, let's say, the first domino falls in 1517, we see a progression of issues that happen in the church. Confusion about sacraments, confusion of the role of the saints, confusion about what we believe, why we believe it, what we're supposed to do. And that confusion kind of reaches ahead by the mid-16th century. In the mid the, the, the Council of Trent, uh, as it rolls its way to 1563 and complete completion, they be the church begins to think about 
how to address these problems. And it's one thing to write a bunch of decrees and a bunch of papers and a bunch of, bunch of announcements, but how do you transmit this information to the everyday people? And you put it in the place that they know best, the place where we go to celebrate our faith, the churches, and you bring artists on board to help you to transmit these messages. So this is the context. We get to be 1580, 1590, 1600, 1610. We are helping to train and form artists who will put beautiful paintings in churches that can still speak to people about the faith 400 years later. And Caravaggio fits into this category despite the fact that his personal life on paper, not a good representative for the church, but his art expresses that tension, that incredible tension that's so, so evident in this period of the post-Reformation. Within this historical context, Caravaggio was commissioned to represent the figure of St. Matthew, a publican tax collector who first became an apostle and later wrote one of the Gospels. It is this image where Caravaggio does something that I think is very important with artists. Michelangelo does this, Leonardo does it, Caravaggio does it. He plays to his strengths. He's doing a story that's been painted a million times, and he's going to show us Matthew, the wealthy tax collector, what can Caravaggio do that no one's ever done before? Well, he's a still life painter. So he'll show us silks and velvets and brocades, the colors, the richness of the most beautiful clothes of the 17th century. He's not trying to show you outfits from the first century. He's showing you the most beautiful, the Versace, the Armani, the Louis Vuitton of his age. So these men are beautifully dressed. They're sitting at a table with cash strewn on the table. They have everything they can possibly want. A sword because of the status that they hold in society. And here we look at them thinking, yeah, that's what I want, and then emerging from the right-hand side, from the side of the altar, emerging from that side, two barefoot men in simple, simple roads appear into the scene. And the younger of the two men, who is Jesus, reaches into the fold, and he tells Matthew to follow me. And that excitement, that startling, that, 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 that deep tumult in the Matthew who's being asked to leave everything behind, Caravaggio captures that moment. The biblical account of Matthew's call is presented by Caravaggio through an extreme sense of light and shadow. Caravaggio unveiled a use of light that had never been seen before. A beam of light that comes from behind the head of Jesus. So behind Jesus, the space of the altar, the light of Christ emerges and hits the face of Matthew and pulls him like a tractor beam. And to let us know it's a supernatural light, Caravaggio even put in a window. So you've got this window and then you, there's no light coming from the window, but this, oh, this supernatural light that will draw Matthew. So it's a very powerful way of making us understand what is conversion to us. As a matter of fact, something very interesting is that there is a modern theory that the figure at the very far end, there's two figures at the end of the painting who are busily counting coins, they're looking down, pointing coins, and, and the idea is today, Maybe those two are Matthew. Maybe the guy with his head down is Matthew. Maybe Jesus is standing there and he's waiting for Matthew. When Matthew's through counting his coins and ready to go, then Jesus will be waiting, which is a beautiful message. And of course, Jesus is always waiting, waiting for our conversion. The other two paintings by Caravaggio, kept in the Cantarelli Chapel, depict other moments in the life of the evangelist. They represent the moment of his inspiration to write the gospel. And his martyrdom. Imagined by the artist as a saint among the pagans, killed in the act of celebrating mass. He just uses color. Basically, look at it, it's a blank background and you have this angel coming down in a spiral. It looks like, again, a beam of light. The angel transmitting that light that awakens, illuminates the, the, the inspiration of Matthew. And then look at Matthew. Matthew is colored in a, he's sitting in a red robe, right? He's got a red robe going all around him. 
and then he's wearing an orange tunic. So what is the effect? Red, orange, it's the color of flame. What does it feel like to be, to be inspired to write the gospel? It must feel like being set on fire. And even when you look at it, it looks like a stylized tongue of flame. So this way that Caravaggio uses the color to show how the light of the inspiration from heaven meets with our human beings, and it turns into this fiery work of the gospel. Matthew, uh, the end of Matthew, he went off to Ethiopia to go baptize. And apparently one of the people who he was baptizing was an assassin who at some point will whip out a sword and he will stab Matthew. And that's the moment we see Caravaggio chooses this moment when the, the executioner or the murderer has stabbed Matthew once. If you look very carefully, there's a mark on the body that he's been stabbed once. He's about to stab him again. And this was the hardest painting of all for Caravaggio to do because this is an action scene. There are people screaming, there are people stabbing, there are people dying. There's a lot of action. And if you don't really know how to draw, that's very difficult to do. Besides his wonderful works, Caravaggio has also gone down in history for his particular personality, spending most of his life as a fugitive after being condemned to the death penalty because he killed a man during a duel. The thing about Michelangelo Marisi da Caravaggio is that in our day and age, we're sort of attracted by the bad boy side. So how do we know his life? We know him through police records. There are about 40, most of them for aggression. We know he killed a man. We know he, had a, he hung around with the seedy underbelly of, of Romans. So we see him as this swashbuckling maverick who was able to somehow justify his lifestyle by producing really beautiful works of art. But in doing that, we miss part of the picture. So yes, we're dealing with a man who was personally troubled and had difficulty living a perfect Christian life, like well, all of us. He, he, but he did have a capacity to transmit a message, which was the message the church was looking for during the period of the early 1600s when he was active in Rome. So he was able to be a tremendous contributor to the, um, to, to, the, to the mission of the church as expressed through art in this period. Tormented, exhausted, and with a high fever, Michelangelo Merisi died alone in 1610 in Porto Ercole, Tuscany, about 100 miles north of Rome. But his works, marked by his signature use of light and shadow, introduced a new artistic method that still carries his name, Caravaggism. <laughs>